Friends, if you search on Google for the most beautiful equation in the world, this equation will appear before you. We call this the Euler equation. e to the power of ip plus 1 equals 0. Well, in this video, I will explain to you why this equation is considered so beautiful and at the same time, I will also explain why this particular form of the Euler equation is not actually that beautiful. By the end of this video, not only will you understand this equation, but you'll also have a complete grasp of the entire concept behind Euler's identity. Plus, you'll learn what the connection is between exponential functions and circles, because at the end of the day, the main concept of Euler's equation is exactly this, using the exponential function with imaginary numbers to describe circular and oscillatory behavior. So, in the last video, I explained in detail about exponential functions and growing functions, if you take any growing function, like 2 to the power x, and take its derivative, the derivative is smaller than 2 to the power x. Similarly, if you take 3 to the power x, its derivative will be greater than the original function, as you can see in this graph. But the number e is the only number whose derivative is equal to the function itself. Whether you take its derivative once or a million times, the behavior of e to the power x doesn't change. Basically, it's an equilibrium point. And at the end of that video, I asked you a small question. If you multiply the exponential function by just one number, that is e to the power e theta, which is cos theta plus i sin theta, then by multiplying with an imaginary number, the function that was previously growing exponentially now becomes a circular or rotational function. So today, we'll explore in detail why the introduction of this imaginary number changes the entire behavior of the function. Well, before we move ahead in the video, if you haven't watched our video on exponential functions, go watch it first, the link is in the description box below. So, a to the power i pi plus 1 equals 0 is considered the most beautiful equation in the world. Why is it so famous and why does everyone consider it beautiful? Actually, the answer is that this equation contains 5 constants. a is one constant whose value is 2.718. The imaginary number i is also a constant. 1 and 0 are numbers, so they are also constants. So you can see that in just one equation, all these constants are together, which looks really cool, but actually, it's a very superficial way of looking at mathematics. This is only for those mathematicians who get happy just by looking at numbers. But here, I'm going to prove that this equation isn't all that special. This is just a special case of e to the power i theta equals cos theta plus i sin theta. Let's make a table to understand this, where we'll plot e to the power i theta for different values of theta. So we'll set the value of theta to 0, then pi by 2, then pi, then 3 pi by 2, then 2 pi. So when we put that equal to 0, what is the power iota 0? Cosine 0 plus i sin 0. The value of sine 0 is 0, and the value of cosine 0 is 1. So in this case, we get the answer 1. Now, if we put theta equal to pi by 2, the value of cos pi by 2 is 0 and the value of sine pi by 2 is 1. So what answer do we get in this case? Iota, that is i. Now look at the third case. Now if we put the value of theta as p, then e to the power iota pi equals cos p plus e sine pi. Now the value of cos p is minus 1 and the value of sine p is 0. So what will this simply become? e to the power iota pi equals minus 1. Now look at this carefully. If we take 1 to the left hand side, what will it become? 8 to the power iota, pi plus 1 equals 0. And this is what becomes the most beautiful equation in mathematics. So you can clearly see that e to the power iota pi plus 1, e to the power iota theta, where theta's value is pi, this is its special case. Similarly, when we put theta equal to 3 pi by 2, in this case, we get the answer minus i. And finally, when we put theta equal to 2 pi, then cos 2 pi plus i sine 2 pi, its value is 1. So now, if you plot all these values on a plane, you'll see that e to the power i theta is moving around in a circle. At angle 0, its value is 1. At 90 degrees, the value is i. At 180 degrees, the value is minus 1. At 270 degrees, it's minus i. And at 360 degrees, that is, at 2 pi, its value becomes 1 again. So basically, here the values are moving in a circular form. So this famous equation, that is Euler's equation, is just a special case when theta equals pi. If we put theta equal to pi by 2, then e to the power iota pi by 2 will be equal to i. There's nothing extraordinary about this. The real equation is, or rather the real beauty is, how? 
how does an exponential function, when multiplied by just an imaginary number, give us sin and cosine terms, and how are sin and cosine actually related to oscillatory and circular behavior, and ultimately why? Why does this equation, which has an exponential term, perform circular and rotational motion instead of growing exponentially? This is where the real beauty lies. So, let's try to understand this now. Whenever we encounter something that goes beyond our normal intuition, we have a basic principle to understand it. We break that thing down, divide it into small pieces, and then later combine all those pieces together. So we'll do something similar here as well. In mathematics, whenever we need to break something down, we take the help of our friend called the Taylor series expansion. Basically, we will apply this to e to the power x. So basically, the Taylor series expansion is a mathematical tool that breaks functions into small pieces and then adds all those small pieces together and then we get a complete understanding of that function. So basically, it's like a hammer and glue, where the hammer first breaks things apart and the glue puts them all back together. So remember, whenever we need to break down a function, we use the Taylor series expansion. By the way, we'll discuss the Taylor series in full detail in another video. Now here, look at e to the power x with the help of the Taylor series expansion. How can we write this? e to the power x equals the summation from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the power n divided by n factorial. Here, n basically runs from 0 to infinity, and the n factorial you see here, the meaning of factorial here is simply that you take any number and multiply it by all the numbers before it. For example, 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, and 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So now, let's look at this with an example. By the way, this example is also a special case. What will happen if we take x equal to 1? e to the power of 1 equals the summation from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the power n. So since our x is 1, it becomes 1 to the power n, and 1 raised to any power is always 1, so it's 1 upon n factorial. So now, if we want to remove this summation sign, we'll have to expand this series and see. What will happen by doing this? We'll get a description of all the terms. So let's expand it and write it out. So what will the first term be? 1 upon 0 factorial, 0 factorial is just 1. So 1 plus 1 upon 1 factorial, plus 1 upon 2 factorial, plus 1 upon 3 factorial, plus 1 upon 4 factorial, plus 1 upon 5 factorial, and so on. Now we can also write the values of all these. 1 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.16 and so on. And when you add up all the terms, do you know what you'll get? In fact, you'll get the answer 2.718, which is actually the value of e, as we all know. So when we put 1 in place of x, we got the value of e with the help of the Taylor series, and you can see how we got it. Basically, we used the Taylor series expansion for this. Basically, we broke it down using the Taylor series, and after plugging in the values, this is what we got. So now we'll do exactly the same thing, but instead of the special case, we'll do it for the general case. That is, what will happen if, instead of e to the power of 1, we put e to the power of x? So you can simply expand this as well using the Taylor series. e to the power x equals the summation from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the power n divided by n factorial. You can expand this as well. So what will happen? x to the power 0 divided by 0 factorial. Now since anything raised to the power 0 is always 1, we can write the first term as 1. So 1 plus x divided by 1 factorial plus x squared divided by 2 factorial plus x cubed divided by 3 factorial plus x to the power 4 divided by 4 factorial plus x to the power 5 divided by 5 factorial and so on. So simply you can see that all these terms will keep continuing like this and will eventually converge at some point. Here, you can see that all the terms have a positive sign, so basically this is the general case. We just need to substitute the value of x and we'll get the answer according to our requirement and I guess all of you are comfortable up to this point. Everything has been going smoothly up to here. But think about what would happen if we substitute something interesting in place of x. What would happen if we substitute an imaginary number in place of x, that is e to the power iota theta. Basically, we haven't done anything except put iota theta in place of x. Now, if we look at the Taylor series expansion for this as well, what will it be? There won't be any change in the first term. 1 plus iota theta over 1 factorial plus iota theta squared over 2 factorial plus iota theta cubed over 3 factorial plus iota theta to the power 4 over 4 factorial plus iota theta to the power 5 over 5 factorial and so on. 
So basically, we haven't done anything here. We have just substituted iota theta in the first equation and clearly you can see this. So now, the main role being played here is the introduction of the imaginary number. When you use the imaginary number iota, something interesting happens. i, which is an imaginary number, look at the pattern of its powers. For simplicity, let's look at the values of i here. i to the power 1 is i. i squared equals minus 1. i cubed equals minus i. And i to the power of 4 equals 1. Now see, why is i squared equal to minus 1? Why is i cubed equal to minus i? So basically, this is a property of imaginary numbers. And I guess all of you already know how this works, because by definition, i is the square root of minus 1. So when you square it, you get minus 1 and so on. Now, we will put all these values of iota into this series. So our series becomes e to the power iota theta equals 1 plus iota theta minus theta squared upon 2 factorial minus iota theta cubed upon 3 factorial plus theta to the power 4 upon 4 factorial plus theta to the power 5 upon 5 factorial and so on. So basically we substituted the values of iota depending on the power. So our equation turned out like this. Now you must already be noticing an interesting pattern here. We saw in the case of e to the power x that all the terms were positive. There was no alternation there. But in this case, when we substitute iota theta, when we put in the imaginary component, something interesting starts to happen. We start with plus 1, then we reach i, then after that we reach minus 1, and then minus i, and then again we reach plus 1. Then again at plus i, then minus 1, then minus i, then again plus 1. This pattern just keeps repeating. So what we are seeing is that when we break down the behavior of each term using the Taylor series, we notice that it starts alternating. Basically, it started to look like a circular pattern. So from here, you might be getting an intuition as to why it behaves like a circle. Because you can already see the alternating behavior in the terms. Now here we can do one more thing. Here we can count the different terms separately. Let's split them into two parts. The first part will be those that contain the imaginary number and the second will be those that do not contain the imaginary number and will write both separately. So first, the ones that contain the imaginary number will be as follows. iota theta minus iota theta cubed over 3 factorial plus iota theta to the power 5 over 5 factorial and so on. Now what else can we do with this? We can separate out the iota. So iota is factored out leaving theta minus theta cubed over 3 factorial plus theta to the power 5 over 5 factorial. Now, if you look carefully at the series inside the brackets, you'll see that it's nothing but the sine theta series. So whatever is written inside the brackets, you can simply replace it with sine theta. So what do we get? Iota sine theta. Similarly, if we look at the real terms, it's 1 minus theta squared upon 2 factorial plus theta to the power 4 upon 4 factorial and so on. Now, if you look carefully at this series as well, it's nothing but the cosine theta series. All these terms that are written here, you can simply write them in short as e to the power iota theta equals cosine theta plus iota sine theta. So basically, it's a magic trick, an exponential function that is used with imaginary numbers. When we broke it down using the Taylor series, we found several components and then all those components finally become sinusoidal functions. We get the cosine and sine terms, which represent alternating and circular behavior. So friends, this is the real beauty. How despite being an exponential function that was supposed to grow exponentially, when multiplied by an imaginary number, it becomes an oscillatory function. Well, the real beauty isn't just that you see five constants together in this equation. The true beauty lies in the logic behind it, how it explains this oscillatory behavior. When Euler described this in 1748, I know he must have thought the same thing. Wow, this is so mind-blowing. And I guess, just like Euler, your brain will also find this mind-blowing. So friends, that's it for today's video. I hope you really enjoyed this video. If that's the case, then please like this video, share it with your friends, and if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, do subscribe so you don't miss any updates from our upcoming videos.